Hello, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to that seminar. So we start? Okay. Uh, so today's speaker uh, is Vimal uh, Kumar. Vimal, he is a student here at the computer science department. He's working with uh, professors Mazuris and, and Balaj Brabakar. And he has been working on different things in networking for network troubleshooting, uh, performance, uh, virtualization, and uh, network emulation. And today's talk is on IQ, a work that he has done between Stanford and, uh, and Microsoft. So. Okay, so thanks, thanks, Janis. Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be talking about what this is. Uh, maybe I'll come to it at the end of the talk. Uh, so, so I'm going to be talking about a system that we built uh, called IQ. Uh, so as Janis mentioned, we started work with, uh, with Stanford uh, and Microsoft. Uh, and, and yes, Rockstar as well. So, so, you know, things used to be really good uh, sometime in the last decade. You know? uh, companies or enterprises uh, used to build their own data centers and maybe one thing was clean and someone else used to build their own random data centers and put in a co-location somewhere. So the nice property of this data centers was that you knew, you bought your own equipment and you knew exactly the performance that you were buying. Okay. So if you bought a gigabit of network, you get a gigabit of network. If you bought some CPU, you get exactly that CPU. Dedicated, no problem at all. But then sometime in the last decade uh, came the cloud and it basically promised to lower the cost for many medium scale enterprises as long as everyone started like sharing resources, right? So we share, whenever we want more, we scale up, and we scale down whenever we don't want so many resources. But then, what happened to performance? Well, this is an example of what could happen. Uh, so this is a graph that I took as of today morning. Uh, and yes, I woke up at about 6.30. Uh, so this graph shows the performance of a memcached decline on a shared Memcached D cluster hosted by Google App Engine. So you can go to this website and, link and check the live statistics. So what this graph shows is that the mean and median latencies for the Memcached D GET requests okay, are sort of okay. They are well within like tolerable limits for an interactive application. But then if you see on the y-axis, the 99th percentile latency just shoots up and down. Okay. Depends on the time of the day. Probably depends on whom you're co-located with. But the point is that the 99th percentile latency just varies throughout the day. And you can, in fact, check the historical trends on this website. It's very really amazing. Um, so some of you might be wondering, OK, why do I care about the 99th percentile latency? Or, well, yeah, of course, or even latency. Right? Uh, and to, to, to say why, let me give you a very simple example. So today, a lot of applications uh, cannot fit really on a single machine, so they run in a distributed setting. So this, a typical web application has a front-end web server that gets requests from the World Wide Web. And at the back end, you have some servers, such as a database, which is typically distributed across multiple machines. This could be even caching machines or databases or whatever. And then the front-end web server, depending on the request that it gets, is going to fan out a number of <coughs> internal requests to generate the final web page that you're hoping to see. Okay. And this architecture is typical, and it's called like a partition aggregate workload, and it's been seen like in many online web services, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Reddit's, and so on. So the interesting thing about this is that if the front-end web server is going to issue a lot of requests to its workers, the response latency, which is the time the user sees for the web page to be rendered, is going to be affected by the speed of the slowest worker. And in fact, you can work out the math, and it turns out that as your 99 percentile, or even like the high percentiles of your latency increase, then you will be dominated by the tail end of your latency for your external web response. Okay. So this is why some people care about the 99 percentile latencies. And well, meanwhile at Facebook, I saw this graph at NSDI this year, and this basically denotes the data dependency tab. So every node is a piece of data that has to be fetched, possibly involving multiple rounds between servers within the data center. And this is the dependency graph for, I don't know what request, but they say a small request. So complex web applications do exist here. So, so yes. In the, in the web context, this is you know, just a simple, simple example of head of line blocking. There's a well-known solution to that, and that is just have 
have um, allowed things to come in to be returned out of order. And they're both they're both web systems like Speedy, which allow you to, to return things out of order. And they're also many excellent examples of web pages that load the framework and then this thing come back, they just come back. Sure, you can do that. In fact, a lot of applications actually do that. In the sense, they're not going to wait for like every single web server or response to return, but it's going to lower the quality of the results. And in fact, the lower quality of the results you're having is probably going to go down. And there are number of studies that show why the latency actually matters. But anyway, so this is a complex dependency graph. But then this is not just endemic to one particular cloud provider. So I said Google App Engine in the first slide. But then, so some of my friends here, they run a startup on Amazon EC2 when I bought 12 servers. And I basically asked for pairwise ping latencies collected over a period of three weeks. Okay. And this ping latency, I just plotted them on the x-axis. So the x-axis is just time. The y-axis is the ping latencies in microseconds. The mean latencies are sort of OK. So ignore this 10, 20, 40, it doesn't matter. It's just a time series. But then if you look at the 99% per latency, it shoots up and down. So it's just not one cloud provider. The problem exists in many cloud service providers. Okay. So there could be many reasons for why the performance is actually very unpredictable. <coughs> it could be CPU. It could be scheduled out by a hypervisor. Uh, but one, one thing that is guaranteed to cause this problem is network congestion. Okay. So in fact, the sad state of affairs of how we manage a network bandwidth today in our data centers can be summarized by this one graph. It's just a huge traffic jam. So the utilization of the data centers are continuously increasing. And the reason why the utilization is increasing is because operators or providers, they want to pack more and more services onto a single machine to increase or decrease the uh, operational expenditures. So we're seeing a, an increase in utilization. An increase in utilization is going to cause more congestion. More congestion leads to more packet drops and bad performance for everyone. So how are people reacting to this condition? Uh, so before I go into that, as I said, the key issue that we have today is that the today's transport protocols are not dealt or are not built to uh, satisfy predictability. I'll come back to this point in the later slides. But let's see how people are actually dealing with these issues today. So just survey the blogosphere. People had like, a lot of interesting comments. Uh, so one thing popped up. So this, this was an analytics company that they are that ran the entire startup within the cloud. Uh, they said, well, the performance that we have in the cloud is just so bad that we just gave up optimizing our applications and we just moved off the cloud. Now, for the providers, this is bad because they're losing revenue as customers move out of the cloud. This does not build confidence in a cloud infrastructure or in a shared infrastructure in general. Okay. Some other organizations, they are technically very mighty uh, and they love challenging the status quo. They love solving like, interesting problems. And in fact, what they do is they just go around. Oh, thanks, Bob. They just go, they rewrite their entire application stack. In fact, uh, if many of you have been reading the Netflix blog, they're taking a lot of pride in saying that, okay, we've developed a lot of interesting applications that really test our applications against like performance variability. Well, they can probably do that, but frankly, I don't have so much patience to rewrite my entire application stack. Uh, so these are like the two major approaches that people have done to like deal with this performance and availability. But I'm going to say that there's perhaps a some slightly simpler approach. Okay. So one way you can sort of deal away with this performance interference is if you start offering each virtual machine or each service some kind of a rate guarantee. So I'm going to posit that rate guarantee is a good thing because it achieves some kind of uh, isolation. Because the rate guarantee that you provide or that you give to a customer is not going to be dictated by the performance interference of like, any other customers. So predictability can actually mean different things for different applications. Now, if you don't know anything about the traffic patterns, <coughs> perhaps rate guarantees are the best thing that you can give to your <coughs> Like you do whatever you want, I'm going to give you some amount of bandwidth. I'm going to delve into like, what this precisely means in later slides. But then if you're running a web server, maybe all you care about is like, as I said, bounded response latencies for your request. Right? And this is actually, interestingly, is a function of the band. You can work this out. It's a function of your band. And similarly, for MapReduce jobs, you can say, well, I really, what I really care about is not really rate guarantees for my MapReduce jobs, but I want my jobs to complete within a certain amount of time. <clears throat> this can be a definition for predictability for some kinds of jobs. And similarly for network storage. But the underlying theme behind all of this is that there's a notion of rate guarantee that you want to give to maybe a VM or a set of VMs that's going to help you design algorithms for all these things. Okay. So, coming back to 
the status quo. What do we have today? Well, the state of the art in managing network bandwidth, uh, which has been deployed, widely deployed, for the past 35 years is TCP. And TCP has like, really served us well in managing congestion. But then TCP is not really good because it doesn't satisfy our predictability requirement. So back in those days when we had download accelerators, just open more and more parallel TCP connections, you get more bandwidth. It's easy to game the system, so therefore this is good. Okay. So of course there are other ways to deal with this. And you might say, well, as a provider, I'm going to start rate limiting my tenant customers, maybe at the grand variety of VMs. So if a customer has 10 VMs, each VM just gets a gigabit of transmit capacity. And this should give you some sort of isolation, right? But no, it's in fact very easy to game this system as well. It's very easy to see why. Let's <coughs> say you have two tenants, the red and the green. They're distributed throughout the data center. But then two VMs of different tenants are co-located on a single physical machine. <coughs> okay. And maybe red is given 2.5 gigabits per second, and green is given 7.5. Maybe in this scenario, it works out all right. But then as red keeps increasing its VMs, it's just going to get more and more bandwidth at the receive side. So just static rate limiting on the transmit side is not really sufficient. It doesn't solve the problem. Unfortunately, this is what providers do today. They don't do anything more than rate limiting on the transmit side. Some of you might say, well, why don't you do rate limiting on the receive side? Right? I mean, you can monitor for bandwidth. If the traffic exceeds, then you start dropping packets. But it's not really going to help because the traffic has already done its damage in transmitting across the network, <coughs> consuming all the resources available in your network, only to be dropped at the receiver, and it's not going to really solve the problem. Okay? So, in fact, uh, there are a number of other approaches to solve this problem as well. You can say, I'm going to use like a class of service queues. I'm going to give each tenant its own queue. So this is going to give me some kind of isolation. Right? Uh, sure, yes, this is going to give you isolation. But then, if you look at a public cloud provider today, you have like tens of thousands of tenants, <coughs> each with maybe like a couple of VMs. Now, if you want to create a, ten a, a, a queue for every single tenant throughout your network, this becomes an operational nightmare. If tenants come and go, they might spawn more and more VMs. You have to keep configuring your network. And actually, this doesn't so really solve the problem because it might give you isolation on a single link. But then, if there are packet, or packets getting dropped on that link, then why are you even admitting the traffic into the network in the first place? <coughs> this can only drop packets. This cannot save bandwidth. I'll come back to this now. And of course, if you've been like reading the networking literature, people have been posting like, okay, I'm going to build like a full bisection bandwidth network. If I have a lot of bandwidth, then is it really going to solve my problem? The answer is no. Because let's say you build this ideal network, okay? You have this network which has, like, let's say, infinite capacity. <laughs> and you have a number of physical machines that are spread out throughout your data center. Uh, so each machine has a fixed capacity access time. This cannot be infinite. So maybe it's a gigabit per second or 10 gigabit per second, so on. So in this scenario, you have like two tenants, the red and the blue. They're sending traffic here. But then as red is going to send more and more traffic, it's going to pass condition on the last one, at the access links. So no matter how much bandwidth you have within your network, you still have to deal with this problem that is happening at the edge. Okay. And I'm going to show you evidence that in fact today's networks are pretty close to this ideal networking fabric. And in fact, companies are building these networks today. So for this, we actually did a condition study on uh, Windows Azure's networks. Uh, so Windows Azure builds networking equipment like this. So they have a number of racks, maybe 20 to 40 servers per rack. And uh, these are connected to a layer of top of rack switches. Okay? So these might have about 64 ports. And uh, the nice thing to note here is that the leaf layer is in fact connected by a high bandwidth spine layer. So these are switches with high fan out, and they interconnect all the racks within your network. And the sole purpose of having these switches is to provide enough bandwidth across your data center okay, that's uniform and is free from any internal bottlenecks. Okay? And you could build fill by section bandwidth networks today. They're not that expensive. And uh, what we have seen in the wild is people don't really build fill by section bandwidth networks. They're often like 3 to 1 oversubscribed, or even smaller. And this is, in fact, being built today. Okay? So on this network, we tried understanding, OK, where does condition really happen? Okay? So we started monitoring a storage cluster, which is in fact one of the hottest clusters that they are operating in. There's a lot of tenants use a storage cluster. 
And uh, we looked at link utilizations on two types of links. So I'm going to call them the core links, which are the blue links here, and the edge links, which are the links connecting the top of rack to the service. Okay. So if you look at the link utilizations collected over a period of like, two weeks, and let's look at the 99 percentile, or 99.9 percentile .9 link utilization. So even over a period of two weeks, this percentile corresponds to like minutes of link utilization, like tens of minutes. And what we saw was that the core links are about 30 percent utilized at the 99.9 percentile, .9, not average, 99.9. And the edge links were way highly utilized. So this sort of suggests that, okay, indeed, in the like race networks, condition, this is a proxy for condition, like link utilization is a proxy for condition, and this happens more at the edge than the core of the network. This could be due to other reasons as well. There could be a lot of black local traffic, which could explain the same behavior. But still, it just supports the observation that condition happens more often at the edge, not the network code. And in fact, while this gives you like macroscopic use of condition, we also looked at the microscopic trends, which is we collected drop counters from all the links, which are cumulative, so they are accumulated over a period of three weeks. And we found that in the hottest clusters, for every packet that's dropped in the core of your network, there are over 1,000 packets getting dropped at the edge. And packet drops is a sure indication of condition <coughs> happening in the network. And in fact, in over 16 of the other sampling clusters that we saw, there were like no packet drops happening at the core. So why is this the case? In this cluster, <coughs> they were running storage application, which uses TCP. So the nice property of TCP is that it doesn't send more traffic into the network than what it can actually claim. It ensures that the traffic is admissible. So we have two centers sending to one, the sum of rates of these two flows do not exceed the capacity that is available at the receiver. Okay? And of course, these networks have a lot of capacity and they use ECMP. So if you have a lot of capacity, you have a lot of path diversity and you end up utilizing all the capacity. So what I just told you was that Various internet networks aren't built in a very random fashion, although there are uh, papers that say you can network it randomly. Uh, in fact, they are built to satisfy the needs of the applications running in the cloud. Okay? And uh, there are a number of research proposals that are being proposed. And in fact, the point that I want to make here is that these research proposals are real. In fact, they are being built and deployed in commercial cloud providers today. Okay? And of course, the other point is that multipath and traffic admissibility effectively push the congestion towards the edge of the network. So, if edge is where the problem is occurring, maybe perhaps that's where we should solve the problem of traffic congestion. Right? So, that brings us to the system IQ. So what we built is a system called IQ, that operates at the edge of the network and it provides predictable bandwidth guarantees. So remember how I told that rate guarantees tie into this notion of providing predictable bandwidth as far as networking is concerned. Uh, so this is good news because now the customers can now provision their VMs and their services just as they used to provision their dedicated services. Right? So you get a VM, <coughs> specify some amount of CPU, and specify, okay, I need a gigabit of network, and you get it. And it's of course good news for the providers as well because knowing the customer's requirements, they can do better placement. So they can place their VMs across the data center. And of course, no provider today shares this, uh, so we have a competitive edge as well. So I'm going to show you how our system actually solves this problem of providing predictable bandwidth guarantees to each VM. So note that the unit of allocation is on a VM. So every VM gets a guaranteed transmit and receive capacity. And the system works in some fashion that I'll get to it, I'll get to it soon, uh, to meet these guarantees as quickly as possible. Okay. So where does this all fit in? I just talked about like one piece of like a big picture which is data center resource management. Okay. So the way people are thinking about data centers today is not that I have a collection of machines and I just want to run some service in them. But think of data center as just a physical infrastructure that provides a resource pool. There's compute, <coughs> storage, and net storage, and networking. And then there's some orchestrator sitting somewhere in the data center that manages this entire resource pool. Right? So maybe a fair CPU streaming is going to give you CPU guarantees or CPU isolation. And where IQ fits in is the networking part. It's going to give you rate guarantees. Okay. So this is a brief recap. <coughs> I said network condition predominantly happens at the edge of the network. I give you evidence supporting the claim. I'm going to show you how this leads to a very simple design 
for managing bandwidth at the edge. So let's start with the, uh, the goals. Okay? So isolation is one. The other goal is that, let's say there are VMs in your data center, and maybe some tenants are just sitting idle. If you have spare capacity, you should be able to redistribute the spare capacity to tenants who probably need it. Okay? So I'm going to come back to this using a simple example. So notice that I said IQ operates at the edge. By the edge, I'm going to say for this example, it's a shim layer which is sitting inside the hypervisor and it's able to intercept all traffic. So you could use OpenV switch, for example, to intercept all traffic. Uh, and this exists at the edge of the network. So I showed you that the network is not predominantly a source of condition. I'll get back to this assumption later. Uh, so I'm going to remove the network. And let's say there are two tenants, the red and the blue, and they give them two gigabits and eight gigabits. And of course, they share a common 10 gigabit per second. So initially, let's say there's just two flows. Red is sending to the receiver. There's a lot of capacity available. So each flow gets five gigabits per second. There are no problems. But let's say blue starts sending traffic. So it needs some level of bandwidth, right? So when blue is starting to send traffic, it's going to cause congestion at the last stop. Now this congestion, notice that this condition is actually local. The server can immediately detect the fact that this condition is happening just by looking at the link utilizations. It's going to reach capacity, right? So it's going to use this information. I'm going to get to like what is the exact mechanism. Bear with me. And say, give this blue 8 gigabits per second, because that's what it asks for. <clears throat> and then the remaining capacity is split equally, let's say, between the two sources. Okay. Let's say a third flow starts now between the VM on the left, distant to the VM on the right. It wants maybe a 5 gigabits per second. Okay. And of course, this is going to cause a condition here because the available capacity is just 10 and the utilization is 13. And let's say you split the capacity in this ratio, 5 and 5. Now, what I want you to notice is that the act of reducing bandwidth here on a physical machine that's somewhere within your data center is going to free up capacity at the receiver. And this can again be locally detected. Okay. And the spare capacity can in turn be waterfilled. So you're going to give the available capacity to the main two flows. So of course, you cannot meet the rate guarantees for the VM on the right here because it's bottlenecked at the source. So wherever you have sufficient demand, you get your rate guarantees at your bottleneck, but then I cannot make promises anywhere else. This, this is what you would expect even on a physical network. You cannot get rate guarantees everywhere else. So question, what, what, yes. do you do, what do you do 50-50 rather than proportional allocation? You can do proportional allocation as well. This is just an example. Okay. So, any questions so far? Okay, I'm gonna dig into like how this actually works under the code. Uh, so recall that I said uh, this link utilization as it changes can be observed locally. The way we do this is we instantiate what are called condition detectors. <coughs> now these condition detectors are just byte counters that are created for every single VM on a receiving machine. And there are two here, so you create two. And these byte counters are basically going to track the link utilization for this particular time. Okay? And in this case, it's allocated a capacity of two gigabits per second and eight gigabits per second, and it's going to track this. Now the job of this condition detector is just very simple, is to ensure that the aggregate incoming rate okay, matches the capacity that is being allocated to this condition detector. In this case, it's two gigabits per second. Now, this is a job of condition control algorithm. I mean, if you do this using condition control, and that's what we do. We use a condition control algorithm that's developed here at Stanford called RCP. I'm going to call it RCP star because it's a slight modification of it. And the way it works is it just monitors link utilization and it sends explicit feedback to the sources and the sources are going to be rate limited. And notice that this rate limiting is happening in the trusted domain inside the hypervisor. So we don't expect tenants to obey these rate feedback packets that we send them. They're actually going to create rate limiters and then rate limit traffic. And notice that these rate limiters are dynamic. You don't create a fixed rate limiter for operating at a fixed capacity. It's going to, the rate at which it's going to drain is determined by what happens at the receiver. Okay. So let me delve into the sub-problem of determining this rate. So in a little more detail. How do yes. you, how do you uh, uh, monitor the congestion? How do you know this congestion is? Look at the queue size, or you look at the number of packets, and how do you collect we, the we, bas we basically monitor link utilization okay. at like 200 microseconds. <coughs> yes? Are you going to talk about how it's done at the level? Yes. Okay. So, so consider this sub -problem. So you have a condition detector that is being allocated some capacity. In this case, 3 gigabits per second. 
and uh, your job is to ensure that the net aggregate rate matches the frame rate. Okay? And the way this works is that this condition detector is going to keep track of a number of parameters. The first is actually the link utilization. We're going to call it YI. Okay? So this is a counter that's being updated every 200 microseconds. And of course, there's a capacity which is allocated to the kernel, which is here. And there's an alpha parameter, I'm going to come to this later. And its job is to determine just one rate R that it can signal to the senders so that the senders and aggregate converge to this 3 gigabits per second. So how this is going to work is that this condition detector is going to measure YI. It's going to compute RI using this equation. And then it's going to sample incoming packets. It's going to take one packet and send the feedback with the current value of RI to the source address of this packet. And it's just going to continue operation. So know that you don't have to keep track of how many senders there are. It doesn't matter. Uh, you just sample incoming packets and send feedback. Okay. So let's see how this works. So initially, let's say all the VMs start blasting at line rate. Okay. That's the initial value. The aggregate utilization is going to be 10 gigabits per second. The capacity is just 3 gigabits per second. So you're going to say, you know what? You're sending too high. So try 3 gigabits per second. It's going to do guesswork according to the equation. So yes. How have you said this 3 gigabits per second? I'll come to that later. Oh. Okay. And it's going to come and say, OK, send it 3 gigabits per second. The next iteration, all the centers are going to send at 3 gigabits per second. So notice that you don't have track of, keep track of the number of centers. They're going to send at 9 gigabits per second in aggregate. Of course, it's still too high because your aggregate capacity is 3. So you're going to say, OK, slow down even more. Maybe you say send at 0.5 gigabits per second. Okay. The next iteration is going to come to <coughs> 1.5 gigabits per second. Now this is too low. right? So now you're going to increase your guess of R according to the control equation. So I'm going to say, OK, you know what? Try at 1 gigabits per second. And this is a nice thing because now you enter a fixed point, which is, as you measure link utilization, it matches the available capacity to you. And you send 1 gigabit per second, and this operation continues. So this is a fixed point of the equation. Okay. Yes? You don't, really, you don't really communicate with all sources, right? You said you <coughs> randomly pick one. Yes, set, right? yes. Okay. Again. The, the random something works in practice because it's going to pick a sender with sending at high rate, high probability. <coughs> Is there any other questions? Um, yes. It works well with the constant traffic rate, but how does it model against the bursting? I'm going to come to uh, an example that shows you like how this works, like using real workloads and experiments. So you're converting Yes. Yes. So it's going to the one who's sending at high rate if the packet size distribution is, is somewhat comparable across those. The guy who's sending so example like every byte actually with uh, uh, per byte. Yeah. Okay. So let's say in this example one of the senders just goes away. Notice that this process happens continuously. So if one of them goes away, you again recompute a new R, you keep advertising, and this happens every 200 microseconds. Okay. So let me give you a sense of like how this rate evolution actually looks like. So let's say you have 10 senders with long lived flows, sharing a unit capacity link. Okay. And notice that I said there was a parameter alpha that compute, that determines like how quickly you adjust these rates. Uh, that is going to say, OK, initially they're going to start with like 0.001, it's a very small value. And then the rate on the x-axis, you have the iteration. So you have the first iteration here, the second iteration, and so on. And the maximum I put is like about 50 iterations. On the y-axis, you have the rate evolution as a function of the number of iterations. Right? So you start off with a small value, and then you increase. Notice that the value you should converge to is 1 divided by 10, so it's like 0.1. And for different values of the control parameter, you converge in like different patterns. Okay. So for 0.5, you're being like very conservative. So if my utilization does not match my capacity, I'm going to like slowly increase my rate. Okay. And that's why the blue curve increases slowly, and then it eventually converges to 0.1. You said 1 more quick. But then if you start setting like really high values, in this case alpha equals 2, then you start oscillating about the equation, about the about the fixed point. Of course, if you have a very bad parameter, then you're probably never going to converge it out. That's the green line. Okay. Uh, so we have done like an analysis of this equation. And the equation was here. So uh, what, how long was the time on the x-axis? It's number of iterations, about 50 iterations. And notice that we recompute these rates every 200 microseconds. So 50 iterations is like about 10 microseconds. <coughs> <Okay. coughs> 
-hmm. So this is the parameter alpha that I was building for the graph. And uh, we actually use alpha equals half. And we have shown that irrespective of what value of r that you start with, you will be able to converge within 30 iterations. And that corresponds to about 6 milliseconds. So what this means is that if you have like a traffic pattern, then you're going to get bandwidth within 6 milliseconds at the receiver. And for data center applications with like, whose traffic patterns are inherently bursty, you need bandwidth very quickly. And it's going to help us. Okay. So why this is important is that like today's data center switches actually don't have so much of buffering. Deep buffer switches are pretty expensive to build. So you need to react quick enough so that you don't start overflowing the top of flag switch buffer, causing packet drops. Because packet drops are just going to hurt your application performance. And the six milliseconds actually bodes well to the fact that the amount of buffering available today is like a megabyte, which at 10 gigabit per second is about a few milliseconds. So this works well. And of course, to illustrate this, we have an experiment. Uh, we had about like 14 UDP centers that are all trying to blast at maximum rate. And there's also a TCP center which is located on a different physical machine, all trying to send traffic to a single receiver. So these two are VMs, which are co-located on a single physical server, sharing a 10 gigabit main. And all these flows start at Langley. They start at 10 gigabit. Now, what we did was we started the TCP flows first, and then we started all the LDP times. So no attempt was made to like, synchronize these times. They all started immediately. And what we saw was that from time t equals 0 to like, what, 18 seconds, if you look at the utilization for each tenant, TCP gets like 10 gigabits per second when it starts. The mechanism is work-conserving, so you start off getting all the capacity. Now, when UDP starts, it converges pretty quickly. In fact, we weren't able to measure rates at a granularity smaller than a couple of milliseconds, because the overhead was just too high, we couldn't keep up. What we see is that, at least graphically, the rate control converges within a couple of milliseconds. Okay? And of course, the nice property of having an explicit feedback, like RCP, is that it tells, okay, send at this particular rate. It doesn't say, slow down, speed up, and so on. In fact, we did try with a couple of other control algorithms. So notice that you can use any condition control algorithm to limit the sources to restrict the capacity. Okay? So we tried with things like DCTCP. So for the same experiment, if you use DCTCP, you don't need to know what DCTCP is, but the key point of DCTCP is just it says slow down or speed up. That's it. So it's a single bit feedback that receivers send to sources of traffic. Now the single bit, feed single bit feedback actually does work in the sense each tenant actually gets its bandwidth, but then it takes a long time to converge. It takes about 200 milliseconds. You could go beyond single bit feedback and try another control algorithm that uses multi bit feedback, which says, okay, slow down by a factor of two or slow down by a factor of four. Okay. That also works, but your convergence time is going to be slightly longer. So we found that about 50 milliseconds, you get like your guaranteed back. The advantage of RCP is that it tells you, boom, just send it this way. And it converges within a couple of milliseconds. Okay. So putting it all together, the components that we have are, for every single physical machine, the VMs are connected. <coughs> and uh, what we have is for, like per destination rate enters, followed by a scheduler here that ensures that each VM on the transmit side gets the bandwidth that it requests for. Okay. So if there's contention which is happening on the transmit side, each VM will get its bandwidth. And these rate limiters, which are created on a per destination basis, is going to control how much traffic you send to any single destination. So on the receiver side, we have some number of condition detectors. These condition detectors allocated capacities in a similar manner. So we have a weighted fair queuing scheduler. Someone asked this question. Okay. We have a weighted fair queuing scheduler. It's going to determine capacities for each of these buckets. And the job of this control algorithm is to ensure that the senders and aggregate send traffic, which does not violate what's happening with the receiver. Okay. All right. So all uh, I've said so far was under the assumption that the network core itself doesn't get congested. Right? But then in practice, there can be cases where the network core actually gets congested. This can happen if there are transient failures in the network, which you don't have enough capacity. So flows could start colliding within your network because ECMP is just not perfect. And in that case, it's not that we don't do anything. We do have a fallback mechanism. And what this fallback mechanism guarantees is that no single tenant will be able to start. You don't start any single tenant, but you still give bandwidth which is proportional to the number of receivers that a tenant has. Okay. So what, the way we handle that is using ECN. ECN is a standard which is available in like all switches today. So what ECN does is it tells the end host 
or it's a mechanism by which switches can tell ENCOS that there is congestion happening at some link in your network. It doesn't matter which link. So just start backing off. So we do incorporate ECN feedback into our rate control mechanism. So talk to me if you want to know more details about it. Uh, and this ensures that you basically fall back if there's congestion. Okay. And of course, if you have like severe network congestion and there's some partition in your network or something like that, you don't want to start bombarding your network with like lots and lots and lots of traffic. So for that, we have a fallback mechanism too. It's borrowed from TCP. We don't send more traffic if you don't get like great feedback from the network. Okay. So all that I've described today uh, is real. <laughs> Uh, we built we built IQ uh, in software. We built it both for Linux and Windows. The Linux version is open source, so you can visit this website and download it. Uh, the nice thing about IQ is that you don't have to modify any of your software. Take advantage of the fact that you can provide great guarantees to endpoints within your network. So it works regardless of TCP or UDP. Now you can start safely admitting UDP traffic into your network. It's just a current model, which operates regardless of what you have. Uh, there's also a fully functional mini-net version, so you can download and play with it on a single machine uh, to see that it actually works for your applications. And I'd encourage you to try that. So, any questions so far? Yes? Is the 6 millisecond convergence time a magic number completely independent of network size, mixed bandwidth number, and uh, yes. number of version trees? Uh, yes. Yes, that is true. And the reason why the six milliseconds is actually independent of the number of traffic sources or your <coughs> capacities, which are going to mainly determine uh, the convergence time, is that the control loop is multiplicative. So it doesn't matter whether your capacity is one or thousand or ten thousand, you converge within point not one percent of what your capacity should be in like thirty iterations, and that's what we're able to show. Yes. Uh, two related questions. If, if you could, would you have found that you could tell the benefit in having the transmit side part of the RCP star dialog be in the hypervisor or the vSwitch, but the receive side be on the TOR uh, server-facing port so that yeah. if that last link was congested and it did nothing for control packets to still make it, you may lose your RCP signaling or for other reasons. And this related question is, do you know of any switches on the market of the newer generation, either you know, software-based ones, programming ones, that would have let you do that, either from switch to switch or on one end being in the server or the other being in the switch, and still get the same implementation? Yeah, I mean, certainly the mechanism that I described here would perform much better if you started implementing it at the top of flag switch, because it sees condition immediately, as opposed to the end goals that are trying to infer it. Uh, I don't know any switches that can actually start sending feedback. There's sort of like some feedback mechanisms available in switches like uh, priority flow control and things like that. You could maybe hack around or play around with those bits and achieve the effect that you want. But in general, I'm very wary of like putting anything in hardware because it's, once you have it in hardware, you don't, I mean, you cannot change it for a number of years. Right? So uh, I, I was testing the marketing claims of the market, which is all these new ones that say, I'm so programmable, you're going to love it. Uh, how true is so, that for uh, <laughs> <laughs> so many of these programmable switches actually offer a great deal, a great deal of programmability in the control plane. Uh, the problem with congestion is that it's a data plane phenomenon, sure. and there are very few switches today that allow you to see what's happening yeah, in the data plane. Yeah, yeah. The best that we have had so far is QCN, and that was like a standardization effort that took a number of years that gives you this multiple feedback. Uh, I don't think we still have RCP operating on switches yet. I don't know why. Maybe we should just talk to the data and ask why. Uh, but we do have like ECM support, which you can use to like, make sure it converge faster. And we have <coughs> that kind of Thank you. Yes? Uh, ignoring UDP for a second, I'm curious. This is more of an implementation question. So TCP already has a way to rate limit from the receiver side. It's the receiver window. Yeah. Technically, it's not really used very often because it was built in for a different purpose where you couldn't like buffer a lot of packets and yeah. stuff like this. But I actually wonder if you were to essentially hijack the receiver window on TCP and use it, I, do you expect it will work similar? Of course, it wouldn't deal with UDP, but if it was TCP only traffic. Okay. Uh, you could hack around with, I mean, in principle, it is used for flow control of the receiver, right? So you could hack around the receiver window and try to achieve something similar to this. But there are a lot of issues that you have to go through. First thing, you'll have to see how many TCP connections there are. 
need to basically modify the receive window for every single TCP connection. Second thing is you need to figure out what should the window be. That's going to be a function of your know, bandwidth delay product and things like that. Right? Third thing is in a cloud environment, if tenants are actually using some sort of IP set or something like that, you really don't have control over what's within an IP packet because it may be encrypted for all of them. So you don't have to into that. And uh, there are other reasons as well. The smallest rate that you could rate limited TCP flow without having a queue at the center is going to be one window divided by RPG. And that can actually be quite high in the center. Yes? Uh, let's say you wanted to prioritize uh, fairness and convergence times over scalability and robustness. So you decided to throw away your nice distributed solution and go with a centralized one. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of how quickly you converge versus one versus the other, whether that would be practical? Uh, so how would a centralized solution look like? So every millisecond, every host sends to one location of a single packet that details everything needed for a central entity to compute yeah. the schedule for everyone that has knowledge of the current topology. <coughs> and then push that down. You would have to try really hard to make that thing work. Uh, and the reason is that, notice that the feedback packets that IQ is generating are actually on a microsecond time scale. And even operating at the every single micro, or the every couple of hundreds of microseconds, it takes six milliseconds to converge. So if you were to operate at every millisecond, and assume that you have enough servers spread out within your data center that can handle, handle all these feedback packets and computer rate, and then push it back to the hypervisors, it's going to take like at least an order of magnitude more time to converge. So yes, certainly you could do something more interesting if you have a more centralized solution, where you have a global view of your network, but it's probably not worth it. There's a lot of things that you can do in a distributed fashion. Okay, so it's actually specifically looking for whether you, you know the complexity of the central solution, because it would guarantee within one iteration would converge. Not really. No, 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 no. The centralized solution doesn't mean that you would, get, you would uh, converge within an iteration. And uh, the reason is that you really don't know how much each sender has to send in the first place. If you have an accurate knowledge of the number of senders which are active to a particular receiver, which is in fact a very hard thing to do, I don't believe a centralized solution would work in that case. And if, you ha if all those flows have infinite demand, which is they, they will send, let's say, for at least a second, which is again hard to guarantee in a data center environment, it may not be the case, then what you say might work within a single iteration. But most often, that's not the case. Viman, do you but want, I can get back to that. Yes. Do you have to go through the slides and okay. the length? Are you done? Uh, I'm almost done. So I'm going to walk through like uh, one simple experiment, or not one simple experiment, one of the largest experiments that we did uh, to test this mechanism against a real-life workload uh, involving Mancashi. So we had about 16 servers in Packer. And each of these servers had a 10 gigabit link. And 12 of these were designated as client servers. And they basically had a single VM, which is running by Cache client, and a UDP client. I'm going to get back to UDP. Four of these are actually servers, so they're a server. And notice that UDP is actually correlated on each of these. So for UDP, or sorry, for Mancache, we generated a simple workload, which is there's an external close, uh, open loop load generation tool, which constantly generates 144,000 set requests per second. And each of these set requests is distributed uniformly across all the clients. And each client basically picks a server uniformly at random to send the set request to. The set request is about 6 kilobytes. So we work out, this works out to about uh, 2.3 gigabits per second per server. Okay. Uh, the UDP, on the other hand, tries to execute a more malicious workload. Okay. So each UDP client here picks a server at random. It sends the maximum rate that it can for a period of 0.5 seconds and then sleeps for 0.5 seconds. This is going to really stress like, how quickly IQ can provide great guarantees. Uh, and that's it. Each client basically does the same thing. Okay. So notice that if you look at time scales of over a second, or maybe even two seconds, the utilization of UDP tenant is five gigabits per second. So if in this example, you were to give equal capacities, five gigabits per second each to MemCacheD and UDP, the utilization of UDP is like, well within its limits. But then a short time scale is actually trying to be very bursty. Okay. So under this workload, we saw performance with and without IQ for like four different cases. The first case is just a sanity check, baseline performance, establishing the baseline performance of the cluster without having our mechanism in the data path. 
Okay? You have a fresh new cluster with just memcached D, the 99.9% .9 latency of each of these set requests uh, was about 666 microseconds. Okay. If we insert IQ in the data path, it's of course going to be some overhead because this is done in software and there's some overhead here. The 50th percentile latency jumps up a little bit, but then 99.9% .9 latency actually comes down. And the reason is that this control mechanism that is operating in the data path, RCP, is much faster than TCP. And it helps avoid those fine time scale in cast effects that can happen within your switch. And it's going to improve latency at the 99.9% okay. And of course, in each of these cases, the cluster is well provisioned to handle the external load. If you throw in UDP, which is doing its bursty workload across the entire cluster, we see that the median latency actually jumps up by an order of magnitude. And the median latency jumps up because there's excessive queuing delays happening at the source and within the network. It's going to impair the performance of the co-located Mancash server. And of course, 99.9 percentile .9 latency just shoots up because of a lot of timeouts. And TCP, as we know, takes a lot of time to recover from timeouts. Okay. What did the throughput drop? The throughput didn't drop, surprisingly, That's because good. there was enough capacity, so TCP eventually recovers and completes all the settings. So this is actually a latency test more than throughput. And of course, if you have IQ within the data part operating sending these feedback messages, and we have equal rate guarantees to both UDP and uh, MCACHD client and the server, you see that the median latency, well, it's still above, still more than 900 microseconds, by four microseconds. And the 99.9% .9 percentile latency actually comes very close to your parameter performance. Now, you cannot expect this latency to be equal to your parameter performance because there's more load on the cluster in the first place. So there's going to be like slightly higher latencies. But then the point is that without having to modify all my network switches, I'm still able to achieve latencies which are very close to my biometric performance by just operating in a distributed fashion and giving these rate guarantees. So what happened to the UDP traffic? The UDP, good question. I was never asked this question actually. So what happened to UDP is that it gets its 5 gigabits per second over the 0.5 seconds. And over the next 0.5 seconds, it has nothing to send. So well, I cannot do anything. So if you look at the utilization of UDP, it will be at 2.5 gigabits per second. Okay. So that's it. Uh, so what I described today is IQ. Uh, IQ, you can think of IQ as an edge-based flow scheduler that's conceptually similar to like CPU schedulers and things like that. It tries to allocate rates to flows in accordance to VM's bandwidth guarantees. And this operates in a completely distributed fashion. You don't have to change your network switches to await these benefits. You can deploy it today. And in fact, the source code is available online. And I hope some of you will try it out. That's it. Thank you. Yes, Paul. So, Paul, I really like your talk about the, uh, because the, the presentation was so clear that it really led us right into this into this possible solution to the presentation of the problems. So that was really great. Although one other thing that I, I think you could you could say is that you really presented it as this, this problem that the full bisection bandwidth network doesn't actually extend to the VMs. Uh, it, it only act, only really goes to the hardware. Yeah. And so it seems to me that you know on the up, sort of an additional straw man proposal in a you know in a, you know to complement Brandon's dynamic proposal is you could, is as long as you don't really care about uh, as long as you're willing to give up. Um, Work conservation. You can really have a static con a static configuration that simply extended the full bisection bandwidth through the VMs and said that because the key thing that you mentioned because the key component is that uh, clients have to request their bandwidth anyway. So you, you know that. So you, yes, as long as you don't care, once. yeah, they have to do this once. Yeah. So as long as you don't care about work conserving workload, you can really you, you could really use your same mechanism in a static in a static uh, fashion. And just extend the full bisection bandwidth to the to the uh, VMs. The only reason you need the dynamic is if you want or want to be able to take advantage of that extra capacity. So I mean that's a good way of thinking about this. Is like how much extra capacity do I need to get rid of this problem in the first place? Right? And that's effectively like another way of thinking about this. And as I showed, static creativity doesn't really help because if you want to provision your network for the worst case, and let's say you have n VMs that are spread around your data center. You need to have n times the capacity given to each VM in order to completely avoid this problem. 
and n can be arbitrarily large. Well, in another way of looking at it is that the problem is that you have this unfair in-cast, right? Yeah. Where uh, people can game the system by adding different VMs, yes. and, the, and each VM doesn't get throttled. And it could be that you could just give the, the client a fixed amount of capacity and say, look, you have to share that among all your VMs, and if you want more capacity, you have to pay. Yes, that would lead to like severe underutilization. I'll get back to you with like a more concrete example after the talk. Yes. So your work doesn't assume any uh, uh, flow control at the uh, switch level, right? So no. for instance, if you have like a back pressure type of uh, fabric, mm -hmm. uh, what would happen to the uh, So I'm not sure exactly when a back pressure happens. So would you like to walk me through a case? Well, I mean, the thing is that, for instance, like if you monitor it like pops on a, on a switch and they start filling up, you may s send like a pause signal back to the previous node mm -hmm. and stop sending packets. And, and that's like congestion prevention uh, algorithm yeah. in a way. Mm -hmm. And so, how bad would you think would interact with the algorithms? Probably uh, would not affect that much. But well, it, I mean, without like many details, I would say it would interact like in the worst possible manner. Uh, because the moment you have like two control loops interacting, yeah. you have to pay attention to like at what time scales each of these interact with each other. Right. And without like much details, I wouldn't be able to say. Uh, but then, one of the advantages of having like a this thing operating at the edge is that you can operate your network at like near minimum queuing mm -hmm. because let's say you don't allocate like 10 gigabits per second to all your VMs, maybe mm -hmm. you just operate at like 9 gigabits per second peak utilization. Mm -hmm. Then, in most of the cases, you can prevent the feedback that back pressure packets from being sent mm -hmm. because that happens when the worst thing happens when the queue starts building up. Right? Try avoiding queue build up in the first place, then maybe it's okay. Yes. So this is related to what you said in the beginning of the talk. Uh, do rate guarantees always translate into you know, response uh, you know, time guarantees and deadline guarantees and guarantees? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, so in fact, this was uh, uh, a finance exam question in CS244, <laughs> <laughs> which is, let's say you're given a link of okay, some capacity, and you have web requests which are like, of some size, and you have this partition aggregate workload where the front end basically sends requests to its workers and then expects all the responses to come in. Because the total amount of data that you want to transmit from all the workers to the front end is fixed, the total amount of bandwidth that you have at the front end is going to determine the completion. It also depends so, on the yes. window over which you are computing the rates. So yeah. yeah, there's, there's also yes, this, yes, yeah, there's true. And in fact, which is the really want, you know, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to, to you know, bound the maximum completion time or if you're trying to re try to minimize the average completion time we're getting mm -hmm. on schedules. No, I'm talking about the total completion time for the external request. So it doesn't matter when each of the individual flows complete, because you have, let's say, one megabyte in aggregate to transmit, which is like a couple of milliseconds at 10 gigabits per second. Uh, if you have the available capacity within that millisecond, then you can say, okay, if I have one megabyte RPC, it's going to complete within the capital of business. So rate guarantees indirectly translate to the completion time guarantees for flows. And uh, if you look at each flow, then it really didn't, because we share the available bandwidth equally across all the flows, uh, you can give like some guarantees depending on the total load experience of this. And to get back to your, your previous question on like, uh, how does this translate to deadlines maybe for map reduce jobs? In fact, there's been a number of uh, literature work. Uh, people have, in Microsoft research, they work on, okay, I have this map reduce cluster, I want to schedule jobs, I need these tunable knobs on the amount of bandwidth that the job gets, the amount of CPU that it gets, and the number of workers that it has, in order to attain, like, attain a deadline for the job. And I encourage you to look at uh, this paper called Jockey, because they're in uses, and it, it, it talks about all these things. But yes, it gives you the tunable knobs, which are operated at a fairly low level, and now it's up to like, the provider to use these knobs uh, to provide other forms of guarantees. Okay. Yes? So this technique works well if you apply it in the edge, which I consider is the physical machine. Yeah. Like, uh, can this be applied if it happens in the switch as well? Like, for example, you have like, TCP and CAS problems. Can this be applied to such problems as well? Certainly. Uh, and in fact, if like the last experiment it's not as bad a problem though, as both switches because you're breaking the deadline changes. Yes. But so 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 in this experiment we had like a very bursty workflow generated by Mamcache D. 
And we saw that if you have IQ in the data path, it actually reduces the 99.9 percentile latency by a little bit. Uh, and, and the reason why this was the case was mm -hmm. we're able to avoid those in cars effects and avoid Q buildups within the switch, and this actually got down the latencies. So yes, certainly this could help in like uh, for solving other kinds of problems like in cars. Okay, so it's applied still at the server, but it's oh, this is still applied at the server. Yeah, yeah this is completely end was based. Yeah, my question is, you know, have you thought about applying at different points of the network as well? Uh, no. And uh, if you have like more information into like what's happening within your network, certainly there are. Other interesting things that you can do, but I haven't explored that in great detail. Well, I think the answer to the question is could it be, could it be used? Oh, could it be? Yes, definitely. I think it's yes, yes. Yeah. Could it be? Yeah, definitely. And anything can be implemented within the network. It's just a matter of confidence. Okay. So, okay. Oh, I just have a last question. Uh, you talk a little, can you talk a little bit more about what happens when uh, congestion causes signaling packet loss? It's a good question. Uh, so, in the slide where I talked about like what happens if there are failures within your network, if we have collisions or maybe even the feedback packets could get dropped. The source doesn't need feedback like instantaneously, it just takes a while for it to learn what the rate is. But if you never get a rate feedback for ever like hundreds of milliseconds, then you start multiplicatively decreasing the rate. Because you know something bad is happening, so you start climbing up. So what is the overhead from the feedback packets that you need to send? Uh, so for sampling that we did, it's like one in every 10 kilobytes of data received. The worst case overhead, assuming that you send the feedback for every single packet that was received, with minimum size packets, is 64 megabits per second at 10 gigabits. For so like one link for? Uh, for one link. For one product. Okay. It doesn't, it, irrespective of the number of VMs. And so in a, let's say in the clusters that you see at, uh, at, at Microsoft, what was the overhead that you would put into the network? You have, I mean, given the it's number of VMs. 64 megabits per second, second, in the worst case, for every server. How much? 64 megabits per second. For for every server or for every pair of VMs? For every server, regardless every server. of the number of pairs of servers communicating. Okay. Just like 0.02% of the thing, right? That's not. I really think this is kind of a really good example of violating the end to end principle and sort of adding congestion control to things like UDP flows, which are not going to happen. People have done it. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you.